Here we are. I think this is now our third show, uh, doing it remotely. Tim, you were you were asked when you you recently did Film Week, and uh, it was proposed to you. Why do you sound so good? And it's the same thing on the podcast. You sound terrific right now. Why do you sound so good? Uh, well, well, that that would be my four hundred dollar microphone, and of course, I'm using my FM radio voice. <laughs> and of course, between I'm the, between the two and a and a fairly decent laptop. You can you can come out sounding like you're in a studio someplace. And uh, I'm just sitting there using the the built-in mics on the on the MacBook Pro, which I probably shouldn't because I've got an expensive microphone upstairs too. But I I'm just <laughs> I'm, I've been too lazy to go dig it out and set it up. But uh, I probably should. I I keep telling myself. Eh, give me one more week and we'll be back to normal. And, of course, I know that's not true, but uh, that's just me being uh, the, the eternal optimist. I should probably set up for a, a, a semi-long haul here. Um, you know, while we are recording this, and we are recording this literally the day that this is going to go up, April 14th, but uh, our, our governor, Gavin Newsom, apparently is giving a, uh, a talk about when and how the state will open up again. I didn't listen to that. Did you happen to listen to any of that? I did. I did. I've been fairly obsessed with all of this stuff for a while now. And it is. Um, and, and what it really is, and it mostly wasn't him anyway, uh, a, a few of his advisors, it was a, a description of how we would open things up when we decide that it's uh, safe to start opening things up. So it wasn't at all about a date for anything. It was a process. Uh, Yes, it was about process. Uh, okay. So, so we can see that that uh, there will be plainly, at, uh, and and this is how we think we're going to do it. Um, uh, and 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 what was interesting is they were discussing uh, the little problem that they recently had in Japan, of course, because they opened things up in the northern some of the northern uh, provinces of Japan, you know, uh, and boom. Uh, bounce back on them real hard and fast. Well, there's, yeah, so this, this there, is a mistake. There's apparently a guy who literally just today got FDA approval for a saliva test. So, and, and a fairly instant one. Uh, so I, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was interesting. That's, that's apparently something of a game changer too. So yeah, big deal that when yeah. you can test, when you can find out who, um, um, you know, now all kinds of other things are going on too. They're finding that this, um, uh, the virus load seems to hang around for much longer in people's blood than they thought it did. Yeah. And the antibody uh, test, I want the antibody test. Cause I, you know, uh, and I haven't talked about this yet, uh, with you or anybody else, but when I was, when I was over at your place, coughing my lungs out during the podcast back in January, mm. I think there's a better than, than reasonable chance, uh, that I had it because oh, my, because oh, my oh, wife may have brought it back. From, yeah. Very rational way. It, well, my wife believes she brought it back from Paris where there were Chinese shoppers galore. And about three days later, perfect incubation period, right? Mm -hmm. She came down with it. I came down with it. Our daughter came down with it. Daughter got over it in about a day and a half, lingered with us for two weeks, deep respiratory. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a dry cough. I mean, the whole deal, like all the check, check marks apart from fever makes sense. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah, see. Very interesting. Yeah, my, my buddy Gene, who, who, who you know, went to this thing. He came in, um, exact same situation. But you know, had there was no the term COVID didn't exist yet. I think that I've been fairly uh, um, healthy against it because I'm I'm pretty good on all my vax. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I go to the VA, you know, and, and they they shoot you up down there just regularly. Yeah. Just that's what they're just used to doing it. Uh, and uh, and I had a pneumonia. Uh, 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 vaccine. I had, to, uh, you know, what I get the flu thing for whatever. I, I, I sometimes I get two or three flu shots a year. Yeah. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know if that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that I've done it. So, and you, I'll be standing someplace. There'll be a flu, uh, flea, uh, free flu shot, and I'll just get it. Yeah. Um. And I, but and my bones. I'm pretty sure that that's what has uh, steeled me against this dead gum thing. It it could be. It could be. Very well could be. I mean, uh, you know, a friend of mine who is a physician was making a really interesting case yesterday, and we'll get into movies here in a moment, but uh, which is that, you know, uh, people need to get tested, and we need to get people out there building herd immunity, getting to that 80% level where it makes it impossible for recurrences of the virus. That's what he was talking about. He says you got to get to a level of herd immunity so the virus – Basically, just can't can't latch on to anything. Not next winter, not the winter after. Even if you get a vaccine, whether or not you get a vaccine, it ultimately doesn't matter. If you build enough herd immunity to a non-mutating uh, vaccine like this, then eventually it'll just die out, and it just can't it can't hang on to enough people or enough stuff long enough. 
Absolutely. So, herd immunity yeah. is an absolutely exquisite thing. Uh, I, the concept of which is, is not that old. Uh, no. Only the, the concept of herd immunity is only about 75 years old. Uh, and it, it, it's a game changer. And, and it, it, amazingly, sometimes you know, people don't want to participate, in, but it is a game changer in understanding it's not about 100%. Uh, no. Herd immunity, amazing. Yeah. Well, what have you been watching? Let me let me just start this by saying I've been doing a lot of binge watching. Ozark season three was just wonderfully depressing. Uh, that I, I, I just it, it, whenever let me let, let me just step back for a second. Ozark season three introduces several new characters. Tom Pelfrey, who would previously been on uh, Iron Fist, shows up as as uh, the as uh, 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 Laura Linney's brother. Mm. And steals the season. I mean, he he is he is an unbelievable force of nature. He I didn't like him on Iron Fist. He's one of my favorite actors now. He kills the, he kills the season. He just wipes it out. It's it's all it all belongs to him. Also, a new character, a new FBI agent, because the all the FBI agents from last time, you know, were they you you basically once you've corrupted a bunch of people, you got to bring on fresh meat to corrupt. They bring yeah. on. Have you watched season three yet? I'm watching it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. They bring on a lady FBI agent who is pregnant. Yeah, now, the sister, the sister who's pregnant. That's it. I got to tell you, man, on Ozark, when you introduce a woman FBI agent who is pregnant, that means the writers are planning something for season four, which hasn't been greenlit yet, but I think they're, they're that's what they pushed for. They are planning something for season four that is going to be absolutely cataclysmically horrific. <laughs> that unborn child will be the victim of something terrible. I know it because nobody gets off the hook on Ozark. They just don't. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's what it's going to be. I also binged all of Picard. Did you watch Picard? I am. No, I'm seven. Uh, there are eight of those, right? I'm seven. Ten, there's ten. There's, there's ten, ten of them. There's ten. In that case, I got three to go. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm hit and miss with Picard. Um, uh, it, it's a little. It's it's a little too uh, lost in the in the. Um, and, and it's kind of kind of like the, that last Star Wars. Which, oh, you know, it's, yes. It's, it's really doing a whole lot of fan service here. It's and too I, much. I would have rather it stood a little bit more solidly on its own. There's some this, some of these characters don't belong in this series. You mean like the uh, the Han Solo guy who gets to do all the different uh, uh, holographic impressions of himself? <laughs> yeah. Like like what? Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I it, it just it was so depressingly bad to me. The whole show. I in most of my objections. Look, I think it's badly written, badly directed, badly acted. I even think Patrick Stewart has some bad moments in it. I think the the writing is just horrific. It's really and the special effects are ridiculous. Like you have spaceships that are about eighteen feet away from each other shooting at each other. What 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 what? Why would that ever happen? It just makes no sense. You know? Uh like board the other spacecraft at this point. The but the thing that is is most irritating is that is is look, next generation eventually got on my nerves with all the Klingon politics. I think every time there was like a Klingon tribunal to have a trial for something that Worf did that draws on some ancient ritual, everybody's eyes just kind of glazed over and they're like, okay, whatever, you know, the, just it's a bunch of words that start with K and, and I'll just deal with it. This does that with the Romulans. We've got Romulan samurai and Romulan ninjas and Romulan witches and ancient religious ceremonies, and it just it it just got on my nerves at a certain point. Well, that's well. To be honest with you, that's that's interesting because it's the it's the uh, you know, what I would call woo woo yeah uh, stuff that bugs that bugs me in it yeah um, uh, it more it, it, it begins not not to give anything away but but, but the, the the notion is that synthetic people data yeah. people like data, data yeah. You know, yeah they they are no longer a part of the they're not allowed yeah they're not, we start there. Um, and that's an interesting sort of place to begin. Now, I, you have a hard time getting there with me because I knew I watched all of Star, uh, yeah. all, all of all of the Star Treks, and 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 and, I, and and it's tricky with them because you have all these sort of like different timelines that things happen it, on too. So you know you never you never know what timeline you're in, um, like that. But that's not a thing that ever happened in the context of the Star Trek universe. No, that's a as that's... I knew it up to where the Star Trek universe left off that is stealing an, an entire concept from blade runner all yeah. that is is we're, replicants are not allowed on earth yeah. that is all that is I, and, and i mean i i went through that with blade runner already explored that entire theme and dynamic endlessly endlessly and it made you know it's interesting ridley scott was asked at the time uh, or shortly thereafter, what blade runner was really all about and I'm, I'm sure people were expecting a real heady idea and he said apartheid it was about apartheid. That was how he saw it. 
he he read it and he's like, oh, this is basically about apartheid, and apartheid was still a thing in in you know in the early eighties. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so it was relevant then. But I I kind of feel like that theme transported to now and then wrapped around this whole kind of refugee message with the Romulans. It doesn't really make any sense, and it got it just I, the the way that it winds up getting explained still doesn't make sense to me, and I I don't know. You know, seven of nine shows up from uh, from Voyager. That from Voyager, yeah. yeah, and and she's not really playing seven of nine. She's like no. La Fu- she's like La Femme de Kita all of a sudden, and and, yeah. and I don't know. I it just so hot though. Oh, she's uh, fabulous. Uh, it, where, where it's where where it's data yep. aged. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're trying to hide that. I they're, know, but they're, but you're not. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> So you know, let's oh, engage some of this twenty century technology to take twenty five pounds. Poor Brent Spiner. Poor Brent Spiner. Well, let's let's uh, let's dig into uh, the stuff this week. I'm I'm going to start with some PBS stuff. Now that we were off last week, and it, and uh, just so the listeners understand, the show is going to be a little bit ad hoc while this COVID nineteen thing goes, um, because a lot of these supply lines as as the supply chains of everything are being disrupted by this, as everybody I'm sure knows. Um, even food supply chains and, and just about everything else and Amazon is delaying things. So some of the some of the packaged media D V D supply chains have been disrupted as well. Um the the major fulfillment house that a lot of the companies use here, uh that is used by Fox and Magnolia and Lionsgate. Uh, is now only doing essential stuff. So, so there are a number of companies that are unable to get us product, and they've been, you know, proposing sending us links and whatnot. But because this has always been a show about package media for collectors and whatnot, um, we're sticking to our our policy of only reviewing the discs and the things that people can put on their shelves. And we're not going to say, hey, we just saw a streaming version of this on Vudu, and we think you should buy the Blu-ray when it eventually comes out. Um, that's not fair to our listeners. So we're going to we're, we're we're sticking with the uh, the policy of old, and we'll you know everybody understands we're we're happy getting the things late uh, when the supply chains open up again. But a lot of stuff we just aren't going to be able to cover uh, you know in in any degree of timeliness. So we're going to cover what we can. A lot of the companies have been very good about getting the stuff. So we're going to have shows as often as we can uh, justify having enough product for the show. So last week was a little bit of, with Easter and everything else was a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, you know, spring break for some people. So uh, a little awkward, but uh, we're back and I'm going to start with a bunch of PBS. PBS sent us a bunch of stuff. I've got plenty of time to watch all the PBS stuff. Uh, not, not that there's any reason not to. Nope. And uh, got a great Nova here called Animal Espionage, which is a great title to begin with. Uh, and, uh, this is really, really interesting. They, um, it's not about animal spies, just so everybody understands. It's not like recruiting animals to be your, your spies, but it's about how you spy on animals using technology mm-hmm. and it using drones, using nighttime photography, sort of things that enable you to, to observe nature in ways that previous technology did not really allow us to do when there always had to be somebody behind a camera and, you know, Marlon Perkins say, Go chase down that cheetah, Jim. And uh, Jim had to go wrestle a cheetah while Marlon sat safely in the jeep and 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 filmed it. Uh, yeah, we can we can. All you had is like long, 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 long lenses. <laughs> That's right. Or super fast cameras to capture the yeah. hum- the hummingbird or the bee or whatever. I, I um, suppose when digital photography came in, we started to have uh, you know cameras that you could put on a remote control. Yeah. And then get and then you know, the human could get could you know get someplace else. Yeah. Uh, and that was probably kind of cool because now you get these wonderful shots like they have in that of like you know inside the eagle's nest. Yeah, so you can actually see the, the oh, you know the they, eagle tapping its way out of the egg and all that crap. They are they are putting cameras on animals now. They have collars on some some uh, caribou, for example, that have cameras in them. So now the wow. the animals are their own photographers, right? And you're you're right in the middle of the herd. You can observe her behavior and migration patterns and all this kind of stuff. So I mean, it's really amazing. I had no idea. And this isn't stuff that normally winds up on television. This is stuff that researchers use, that zoologists use, um, that that all kinds of environmental groups use to sort of plan um, land use, that plan uh, you know uh, uh, population control, things like that. So it's really, really super interesting and. Uh, Animal espionage is a, and whales especially, like how they're using this to sort of study migration patterns of whales and things like that. It's really, really great. Uh, from American Experience, The Poison Squad. Um, this is uh, rather, under the circumstances, this is rather quite depressing because the FDA has been in the uh, 
uh, in the the, mail, the the news quite a lot lately. And this is a, a, a documentary in the American Experience line that um, looks at the – it's based on a book uh, by, a, by a woman by the name of Deborah Blum. And it looks at the uh, story of a government chemist by the name of Harley Wiley who uh, made it his uh, goal at the end of the last century to sort of improve the food supply of Americans, to get toxins out and, you know, all the stuff that was sort of – you know, it, it was a very third world food supply as recently as 1900. And um, this goes into a trial that he did on 12 people who were known as the poison squad. And he basically used them for human experiments. And it, it wound up sort of giving us all of the data necessary to create the current situation, which includes the FDA and a lot of other uh, regulatory agencies. It's a pretty tough watch. I got to be honest. It's there's some really ethical dilemmas. There's some really uh, dodgy ethical stuff going on, and and some of the things it's it it'll it, it'll make you not want to eat for a little while. Let me just put it that way. Uh, I got a couple of nature. That would do- be great, actually. <laughs> got a couple of nature uh, nature uh, episodes here. Uh, the whale detective is uh, the first one, which kind of goes a little bit along with uh, with animal espionage. Uh, this is really, really uh, quite interesting. This is uh, centered around an event that took place in 2015 when uh, Tom Mustill, who is a wildlife uh, videographer, uh, had an encounter with a, a rather ornery hump, uh, humpback whale. And uh, he uses that incident to sort of go back and to, uh, to try to get inside the... Um, the psychology of humpback whales and uh, what their relationship with humans is, perhaps from their point of view, he's 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 really it's it's a really interesting thing. He just he he kind of it's I don't want to compare it to Moby Dick because he's not really an Ahab, you know, but he kind but he kind of is in a way. He's sort of obsessed with the whale, and, but not in a you know the one that got away way in a way of like that's an intelligent creature and it clearly saw me as some kind of a threat or it was curious and I'd like to know. You know what's the what's the relationship from their point of view? It was quite interesting. I thought uh, exactly what that moment was. It was like this. <laughs> it's like, yo, whale, what's up with that? And whale was like, well, yo, dude, what's up with that? <laughs> but they did it, and you're like, you know, whale. Yeah, exactly. Underwater, underwater. Oh my goodness. Uh, and then another episode of Nature, uh, uh, hippos, Africa's giant, Africa's river giants. I love hippos. Um, they're just, oh, they're, hippos are just so cool. They're, you know, they're, they're kind of like a, a, a water animal, but they're kind of like a land animal. They're not really all that threatening, but they look threatening and, uh, they're just unique. They're just really cool and unique. So, this just goes into the world of the hippos. You find out that they are much more intelligent and social than we ever imagined that they were, and uh, it's fun. They're you know they don't have a lot of teeth, but they're they're fun to look at, and uh, we like them. Uh, summoned Francis Perkins and the General Welfare. Uh, this is a really really interesting um, uh, documentary about a woman that I think a lot of people really don't know uh, about. Francis Perkins was FDR's Secretary of Labor. She was the first woman ever to have a position in a presidential cabinet. And uh, she basically became one of the engineers of the New Deal. In many respects, more of an engineer than FDR himself. It, much of the New Deal was really her doing. And so this uh, talks to a number of uh, politicians and historians, and it tries to sort of give us a sense of who she was, what her role in the cabinet was, her influence on FDR. Um, and it's, it's quite, uh, quite objective. It's a, it's a, it's a no, it's a warts and all documentary and, uh, and really very informative and historically, uh, Fantastic. uh very good. Human being, one of the first sort of a American sociologist, anthropologist, Francis Perkins, played by Cherry. Oh, what's her name? In that movie, Cradle Will Rock. Uh, oh, that's uh, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Cherry who uh, played her in, in, in that movie. Fantastic. Fantastic person. Interesting. Got three for kids here. Uh, Let's Go Luna, Friendship Around the World. Uh, Let's Go Luna is kind of a cute show. Uh, there's ten episodes here. 
It's, uh, you know, it's got kind of a Ren and Stimpy style of uh, animation, but not a Ren and Stimpy sense of humor. It's it's all about learning about, the, it's, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, an- anthropology, learning about the world and the people in it in a, in, in a fun little journeying way that's maybe a little bit better than Dora the Explorer for, for younger kids. So um, it's, it's very educational. It's very well put together. It's very accessibly explained. And kids will learn a lot about geography and culture and language and, uh, and all that stuff. Uh, 15 Frozen Tales, which includes uh, some Let Go Luna, Let's Go Luna, is uh, basically just a, one of these uh, compilation sets. It's got uh, pieces from you know, other, other episodes from uh, Daniel Tiger and Dinosaur Train and Arthur and Caillou and Pinkalicious and Peter Riffick and the Wild Kratts. And it's, it's all just winter stories. Uh, it's a little bit late right now. We're, we're, uh, on the, we're on the tail end of winter in terms of feeling, we're actually in the spring, so it's a little late, but it's it's fine. It's cute. Good. Keep it on hand for next year. And then uh, this is a new one for PBS Kids, uh, Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum. This is uh, based on a book series that I've never heard of, but it's uh, they've done it, it's a, it's now an animated show, and they have twelve episodes, and uh, it's cute. Uh, it's the story of this kid named Xavier Riddle who has uh, a buddy and his sister, and they they are trying to... They do experiments, basically. They are uh, trying to figure out how to meet historical figures by, you know, turning back time. And and uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a, a narrative stretch, but it's... Um, it's actually kind of kind of cute. I sort of I sort of like it. I like the uh, I like the the way that they meet all these figures in time and uh, and these historical figures. It's it's not as educational as I wish it were. It's a little gimmicky, but it's it's good for smaller kids. It's good. And then uh, three dramatic installments from uh, PBS. Uh, the first one is Blu-ray uh, from the from Masterpiece uh, Sanditon which is based on the unfinished novel by Jane Austen. That worried me a little bit because I thought mm. if it was unfinished, that means even Jane didn't think it was worth finishing. So why are we, uh, why are we seizing on it just to, you know, just cause it's Jane Austen. Um, mm. it's, it is, um, uh, it's kind of D- Downton Abbey esque, uh, set obviously in an, in an early, this is 19th century. Uh, so it's, you know, but it has some similar kinds of issues and, you know, uh, sort of centering around this fishing village and uh, and and the things that are transforming it and its people. I, it doesn't feel very Jane Austen. I got to be honest. It feels like somebody's using Jane Austen's name to just do kind of a standard uh, BBC period thing. I don't particularly like the casting, uh, but it's got high production values and it's it's fairly well written, but. It really does get a little bit uh, uh, soapy. So, uh, you know, I'd say uh, take a risk on it if, if you like the Masterpiece brand generally. Um, much more my speed is the uh, Masterpiece version of Howard's End. Mm. Now, I love the movie Howard's End, the Merchant Ivory film. I, I think it's one of the great films of all time. But it is not a perfect adaptation of the book. Mm-hmm. Howard, Howard's End is about 120 minutes long. It's a very, very lengthy book that has a lot of additional ins and outs that were excised for the sake of that movie. This tries to be much more faithful, and this is nearly four hours long. It's almost twice the length of the Merchant Ivory film. Is it as good? No, not in a very broad sense, but it is more literarily faithful to E.M. Forster. It's not a Merchant Ivory film. This is an E.M. Forster adaptation. So if you're faithful about Forster, I think you'll probably really, really enjoy this. It kind of complements the film more than competes with it. Um, and I think it, it has some lovely casting in it. Obviously not the same as the film. It's not, you know, uh, Emma Thompson's not getting an Oscar-winning performance here. But um, you do get Tracy Ullman. You know, it's got a good cast. Uh, yeah, Matthew McFadden, uh, Bessie Carter, Joe Bannister, some really good people here. So, uh, Haley Atwell. So, um, uh, this was probably, I think, originally aired on Stars here, but uh, it um, this is out from PBS only on DVD. And uh, uh, I, the nice, the, the uh, script is actually very, very smartly uh, adapted by Kenneth Lonergan. Uh, so I, I tip my hat to, to Kenneth Lonergan, who, who, you know, is an American and, uh, has done a very, very good job of stepping away from things like Manchester by the sea and, and, uh, kind of, uh, putting on his British cap. And he, he did a, he did a very, very good job here. Very, very good job. Directed by Hedy McDonald, who is a top-notch director too. So that's good. And then lastly, uh, Vienna Blood 
which uh, I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't heard of this. Just showed up on DVD. I hadn't necessarily looked for it. This is a um, uh, a crime drama based on a series of novels by Frank Tallis, and it's uh, it's kind of standard British um, crime procedural stuff. But the backdrop is interesting, and the British always do that. They'll find a historical backdrop or a milieu that's interesting, like Cab Fail, right? You know, hey, he's a monk, and he mm. serves, he solves crimes. So this all takes place um, in Vienna right around that time when you have, uh, you know, Sigmund Freud and uh, all of those famous Industrial Revolution figures and those intellectuals in Vienna floating around. And um, it's really uh, – that, that just makes the backdrop really, really interesting and compelling. And you can kind of overlook the fact that there's a uh, – that it's basically just a procedural. It's more it, – it's a procedural set in a really interesting place and time. And uh, I would recommend it. There are three episodes on this. It's called Vienna Blood. Definitely worth checking out. Good cast. So shall we move to uh, some new movies? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, um, so, Tim, there are two 4Ks that are out this week. One, one of them, one's a quiet place. One is a quiet place in a in a really nice new 4K set, which was originally supposed to coincide with the sequel uh, coming out, but that sequel has now been pushed to the end of the year. So now everybody has a chance to catch up on a quiet place. What were your feelings about a quiet place to begin with? Um, understanding that this was a very entertaining movie, it was. You know, we saw it in the theaters with a big old audience, exactly the way it ought to be seen, uh, and uh, it, it, you know, sort of rolled along with all of that. While at the exact same time, uh, knowing that it was just about one of the dumbest movies I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> just perfectly moronic. This movie, yeah. Um, and uh, it, while being extremely entertaining, look, <clears throat> John Krasinski, of course, um, um, uh, the directing. Uh, uh, the, the the film his sort of big. I, I don't know if this is his directorial debut. Was it? Do you know? Off the, I know no, you know a lot of that, uh, that he, television show he was on. His directorial debut. I can't remember the title of it. I should probably look it up here. It was an absolutely terrible uh, ensemble film uh, several years before, probably about seven years ago. Uh, at this point, it, no, it was, it was a really bad, super artsy ensemble thing i think based on a book but it was really pretentious it was not good at all so oh, he yeah, he totally yeah. Some, something borrowed or something like that yeah he, he, he learned his lesson he decided let's go commercial and he's good he's good with commercial i i agree yeah, well he, uh, he is he's running around that tom clancy uh, uh series jack yeah. ryan playing jack ryan he's uh, he's, he's got to be like the fifth or sixth guy to play jack ryan <laughs> and frankly he's probably been more successful at it than anybody since alec baldwin and uh hunt for red october yeah um, uh, if you go back to that, and, and he directed this big dumb movie, and of course there's the sequel, um, which um, uh, I, I did not see during its. I think it, I think it made it in just under the wire before we got shut down. If I'm yeah. not mistaken, right? Yeah. Okay. And um, you know, and and uh, it, got, it got you know fairly. Uh, you got beat up by critics, but audience. Audiences seem to dig it. Uh, and it's the same thing for this movie. This movie got beat up by, you know, in, there's no legitimate critic who can't look at this movie and not tell you it's a perfectly insane movie. Um, but it works in that sort of big, satisfying uh, a way that these movies work. And it was a big old gigantic hit. And, uh, you know, what can I tell you about it? Did they put anything decent by way of special yeah. effects on that DVD? First of all, let me just complain about the packaging. They, they, I think they sometimes get a little too fancy with the packaging. This thing is a steel book. And it has a plastic sleeve on it. But what they did was they gave the whole thing an infrared monochromatic uh, style. So everything is kind of red and black. And it's impossible to read anything. I mean, it, it, you, you can barely even make out the title on the front. And, and, and because, and because the, the plastic is shiny, it kind of makes it this glare. So it's just in, if they if this thing is supposed to get any kind of uh, traction on a store shelf, and I know nobody really buys off the store shelves anymore, but it's it's just not very pleasing. You literally the, the credit bed on the back, you can't read a word, not a yeah. word. You can't even see the Paramount logo. It's just it's just a blur of red. It's not good at all. But there are some extras on here, uh, not a whole lot. Most of them are on the second disc, which is Blu-ray. Um, which has uh, kind of a, a featurette with Krasinski and and uh, some other behind the scenes stuff. Pretty much all there is. Uh, the HDR is really, really good. The audio is terrific. Uh, basically the same, uh, you know, audio as you had before, except lossless. So, I mean, it doesn't sound or look remarkably better in 4K, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's a nice steel book and it's a nice way to plug the plug the sequel, which hopefully, you know, will uh, will get a little bit uh, a little bit more traction. I know a number of people actually did see it's It's like Milan. A lot of people 
got a look at both uh, Quiet, uh, Quiet Place 2 and Milan before they got yanked. And the word on both of them was very, very positive, but it's going to start all over again when, they're, when their release dates finally uh, push closer. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Doolittle. Mm-hmm. Oh, what the hell was this? What a, what a what a what an astounding mess! But but not really. Uh, I don't know why I thought it was astounding. I mean, this is uh, uh, Stephen Stephen Gahan, right? Yeah. Um, his big hit movie is Syriana. I know. A fairly deep and dark movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, 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 he so, wrote. So he, how do how, how do we get from, in traffic? He, you know, he's I know. On traffic. He wrote traffic. Uh, uh, it, it, how do we get from there to him I don't writing know. and directing Doolittle? I don't know. Robert Downey Jr. I, 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 I don't know. The connectivity of the, the connective tissue of that. I, I don't know. That happened. And, and you know what happens? This really bad movie is what happened. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, there are some extras on here. There's nothing that gives you any sense of how this thing was necessarily developed. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's mostly just uh, EPK featurette stuff. What I'd like to know is, because, you know, I was a huge fan of the Dr. Doolittle books growing up. I love those books. But nobody's ever really adapted those books. They they have a certain almost surreal style to them, like the Little Prince, right? They have that same kind of vibe. It's you know, Doctor Doolittle goes to the moon at a certain point. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. they're very very out there, and to to capture that sense of sort of mirth it, on screen requires a very very special filmmaker. Oddly enough, I'm often a really big critic of Tim Burton, but I got to tell you, if there's a director who's tailor made to make a Doctor Doolittle movie. It's Tim Burton. Mm. Tim Burton could mm. do that if you let him kind of run with it, but nobody ever has. You had the musical with uh, the the you know the Anthony Newley Leslie Bricka songs you know back in uh, in the sixties with Rex Harrison, which I'm fond mm. of, but it's not the book. And then we have the Eddie Murphy movies, which are yeah. re- which are really fun, and, but they're not the book. Those are Eddie Murphy yeah. movies, yeah. and and this is like okay, let's let's. Try to do another Doctor Do Little, but let's just let's just take it in a different direction. And it's a terrible direction. It's it's still not the books, and Robert Downey Jr. seems to be doing uh, his his Sherlock Holmes, except not. And uh, <laughs> and you know when the animals are just talking, it's it sort of defeats the the whole point of it. I don't really. I, I think everybody just thinks that, that the whole point of it is cute animals talking, and it isn't. But anyway, uh, it's a terrible film. It's on 4K. Does it need to be on 4K? It doesn't even need to be on Blu-ray or DVD. It doesn't need to be seen, but I guess they, they have to put it out there. So, um, you know, rent it if you have to. Uh, it, it, Rami Malek is, does a voice in here. Octavia Spencer does a voice. Uh, oh, they, I, they, they tried to cast their way out of this thing. I know. Yeah, Emma, 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 Broadbent, Emma, Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson, yeah. Johnson. It's just ridiculous, but you can't cast your way out of it. No, you can't. You really can't. It's too bad. Just too bad. Uh, let's see what else we got. Oh, oh no, we have another 4K uh, this week. Superman oh, yeah, Red Sun. 4K, yes. Superman Red Sun. So um, interesting sort of thing. Yeah. Imagines that uh, uh, that, that uh, Cal El's rocket landed not in Kansas, yep. but in the Soviet Union. Yep. What if What if Superman had landed with the Ruskies? Yep. What if he were a That's cold? What, he were, what if he was a communist cold warrior? Uh, yeah. It is it is taking the whole alternate history thing into the world of the DC superheroes, and uh, in in which Lex Luthor is now an American like hero. He's an American scientist. Uh, it I I don't know how I feel about playing these games. Um, I'm not really fond of them on television anymore. I, I I don't mind them when they're Quentin Tarantino movies that just sort of come and go within the context of one movie. You but you're in Glorious Bastards, you're Django or whatever. Yeah. Not exactly Django, but definitely yeah. Glorious Bastards. Yeah, and to some degree once upon a time in Hollywood a little bit. But but yeah. uh but I, I don't know how I feel about taking superheroes and and turning them inside out with these alternate personae. I I'm not i I'm not sure what the point is beyond just kind of being a gimmick. I d I don't I don't know. I mean it's yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, though, no, I'm, no, I'm, 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 I'm with you on that too. But not only, not only, not only in that context, but in, in, in a few others. I mean, you really have to come up with a reason, because I, I don't mind a, a reimagining of the universe when you don't already have fixtures in that universe that you have to start messing with. Yeah, uh, and making them do things because now you're just putting, you, you know, you're just putting ideas in the heads of these. So it, it bugs me in that sort of context. Yeah, I mean, here and here's the thing too. What if? 
is a perfectly legitimate question to ask. But what comes after the what if isn't always going to be fodder for a movie. What if Superman was a communist? You know what? Not really interested in that. Remember when the uh, the producers of uh, of uh, Game of Thrones for for a minute went out and said, "Hey, we've oh, got yeah. a, we got a new show. <laughs> what if the South had won the Civil War?" You know what? Not really interested in that. <laughs> really not interested. I, I'm not even really interested in uh, in in you know what if Germany had won World War II. To be honest, that's a Man more in the high castle. Man in the high castle. I I just no. That I'm good for maybe 40 minutes of that, and I get it. Now I don't I don't need to tune in every week to see more. You know, Nazis uh, like uh, Red Dawn. I no, don't really need that. I don't. I not anymore. I like. I saw the movie once. I I wouldn't want a TV series based on that. That's not my thing. So some what if, some what ifs just need to lie there. Uh, a few other things. Tim, Just Mercy. I know you love oh, just, just Mercy. Mercy. You love Just Mercy. Uh, talk about why people should see Just Mercy. Go on. Uh, I'll absolutely love Just Mercy. It, it, it was a little bit in the, um, yeah, not so much the Oscar hunt, but certainly in the award season hunt for some of the, the smaller awards, Independent Spirit, Our Award, and whatnot, uh, uh, Los Angeles Film Critics, um, uh, just this past season. And it really, really is a good film based on a true story about this young lawyer uh, who goes into the Deep South and takes on these uh, death row cases and, and, and tries to get the, these, these folks' uh, the death penalties abated. This particular story is about a man who was unequivocally and absolutely not guilty. Played by Jamie Foxx. Uh, played by Jamie Foxx, wonderfully by Jamie Foxx. Yeah. A, a couple of absolutely extraordinary performances in this movie that didn't pop up, um, that should have been in the Oscar running as far as I'm concerned. Jamie Foxx is one of them. He's playing a guy named Walter McMillan, yeah. an actual an actual figure. figure. And um, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan, uh, and, you know, playing the actual character. Brian, Brian Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah. He looks, looks a lot like him, uh, by the way, which is a, just a, a little bit weird. Brie uh, Larson also in the film, uh, playing, a, playing a wonderful character. And Tim Blake Nelson giving another performance that, as far as I was concerned, was award-worthy uh, yeah. uh, in this movie, playing another one of these prisoners. A deeply, deeply moving movie uh, that I thought was just uh, wonderfully done. So, you know, don't miss it if you get a chance. Did they put anything special on that on that, uh, they, on they, that uh, release? Deleted scenes and three featurettes. Uh, what I wish that they had on here was, and, I, and, and unfortunately it's something they couldn't necessarily negotiate because uh, it's a Warner Brothers movie, but the original, you know, the... the uh, it would, they would have to have made a deal with Viacom and Paramount to get the original uh, 60 Minutes installment. But when the, it, was the origi- it was originally a 60 Minutes piece um, about Walter McMillan who, uh, that, that sort of brought this case to the fore and that put Brian Stevenson on everybody's radar. And Brian Stevenson mm. is an amazing attorney. I mean, he has, he has freed, he has exonerated. Uh, and we should say that not freed exonerated so many innocent people from uh, death row. It's really extraordinary. It's his life's work. Mm. He's really damn good at it. And uh, he's just a, he's he's a really brave figure. And Michael B. Jordan plays him beautifully because it's you know you can you can compare this to to stuff like Murder in the First. And there there are a lot of these movies about you know wrongly convicted or wrongly accused and noble attorneys who take them on. All it goes all the way back to Kill to Kill a Mockingbird. It's kind of the the mm-hmm. model for a lot of these, but. Um, the, to Kill a Mockingbird is a novel. These are real life figures, and yeah. um, Michael B. Jordan finds the finds that place where he plays this guy with a certain degree of nobility, but he doesn't make him into a saint. He's 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 a hardworking guy who makes some mistakes and uh, who learns from his mistakes, and he's not above uh, criticism. But you know, he he just puts his head down and he goes to it. It's a it's a wonderful, wonderful change of pace for uh, for uh, Michael B. Jordan, who you know after after Black Panther, we kind of I, I think we all thought he was just going to go he was going to go full studio and full action guy, but he's 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 mixing it up in a really interesting way. Well, what, what's interesting about his career is that, of course, he 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 did that almost first. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, he was, uh, you know, using that not particularly good, um, um, uh, the Fantastic Four film. Right, uh, that's and, right. Uh, he, he, yeah, he played that, and, um, and of course, he, he did the Creed films, Fruitvale Station. But I love the way he's mixing it up. He's, I do too. He's he's, he's 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 keeping it, he's keeping it legit, uh, and, I, and you gotta love that a lot. Um, what else do we have here? We have a film called Swift. Yeah, um, the animated uh, animated, an, animated film. Do you know anything about this one? I I I didn't see this one when we were, when we did the show. Uh, so so Swift is is okay. It's a CG animated thing. It's kind of it's sort of cute. 
Um, uh, this is from Shout Studios and Shout Kids, the uh, the subsidiaries of, uh, of Shout Factory. Um, it is, uh, how would I analogize this a little bit? It, it's like, it's almost like a, um, it's almost like Finding Dory with birds, maybe a little bit, might be a, a way to do it. Um, it's a, a, a little bit, a little bit of the Ugly Duckling as well. Uh, basically about a, a, a cute little bird who believes that he's a seagull and he's raised by seagulls and then eventually finds out that he was adopted and, and, uh, that he's actually a swift and it's sort of about finding your identity. And, you know, for, I mean, a lot of us, uh, know families that have adopted kids. A lot of us have adopted, you know, cousins and relatives, I mean, adoption is is really something that that affects every family, and it's a, it's a good thing, but it's also a hard thing. And uh, I think there are a lot of really good messages in this that sort of uh, can can help. Uh, like, if you're a family that has an adoption issue or something, probably a really good movie to watch, so that so that mm. you know you can you can address the issue in a way that's mature and accessible for the kids, and and that's really good. Is it a great movie per se? Not really, but um, you know it goes into a into a, you know the usual little place that CGI movies go, a little too action adventure, and it kind of you know goes off the rails a bit. But there are a lot of um, uh, you know like there are these rats, and I, I, it, it it gets a little foolish. But there's a lot of really wonderful stuff and a lot of good messages. So uh, neat, so neat, 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 and voices. Uh, Kate Winslet, yeah, uh, Will the Foe, yeah. You know, yeah, for that's sure. Heavy, that's heavy hitting right there. Yep, yeah. for sure, for sure. Um, we've also got a uh, movie here called The Night Clerk, which oh, I is, saw that one. Yeah, uh, it, it, John Leguizamo and uh, and Helen Hunt briefly are kind of the only uh, Ty Sheridans in it, for, but it doesn't really. It's not a it's not really a big star studded thing. It's a direct to to DVD thing. Uh, Ty Sheridan plays this um, uh, this hotel clerk who. Uh, is kind of on the spectrum, uh, not like a ton, but he's, he's definitely, you know, you can tell there's something just different about him. And, uh, then they kind of detour into this murder mystery and, and he's suspected of it. And, and I don't think it really, it, 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 it's now it's kind of using autism as a, as a trope. And I, that bothers me a little bit. Um, if they had just sort of dealt with the autism as a sort of interesting aspect of it, like the way, like with Tom Pelfrey on Ozark, they don't use his, you know, he's manic depressive, but they don't use it as a trope. They actually let that become a very significant and important part of the character. I don't think they really do that here. So it, it bothered me a little bit on that. But, um, you know, it's always nice to see John Leguizamo show up in things. He just always seems to, to ground everything. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. The, 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 the Cat in the Moon... Um, a little Alex Wolf movie, which is kind of okay, okay, written and directed by him, also stars him. Uh, um, 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 Mike Epps shows up in this movie. And all, all you really have here is this movie about this guy who goes to New York, hang out with his father's, his father's slightly older jazz musician friend. His mother's off in some rehab center. He's a young guy. And he's hanging out with these, these jazz musician cats, and they're roaming around the wee hours of New York. Uh, and they're just sort of showing him what it's like to live in that world and their philosophy and what and, you know life and love and all this kind of thing from a from a perspective from a point of view uh, of which uh, he had never had before and it kind of reinforms him uh, and informs him I should say about his father from whom he had been somewhat estranged it kind of gave, gives him a new perspective and and that of course gives him a new perspective on his mother uh, who's in rehab. Uh, when she when he starts to sort of like filter her and her vibe and her scene uh, through this whole world that he knew nothing about that they were a part of, you know, it's an interesting little walk uh, through New York in the middle of the night is what it is, and I kind of dug it. We have also got a Blu-ray of Frank and Ava, which has a, a pretty impressive cast. Uh, it's got Lucas Haas and Eric Roberts and Harry Dean Stanton. But here's the thing about this, and you can see this on Amazon Prime and iTunes as well, but it's also out on Blu-ray. Um, it stars Rico Simonini. Rico Simonini uh, it, it also wrote the film and uh, directed the film. And Rico Simonini is a cardiologist here in Los Angeles. And um, he, he, really a fascinating guy. I mean, how does a cardiologist wind up making a film? Well, here's how it is. He, mm-hmm. he really loves the story of Frank Sinatra uh, and Ava Gardner. The, the love story, the love affair between Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner, which has never really been dealt with uh, in movies before. Um, our friend uh, and, and colleague, Willard Manis, wrote a stage play about this. And uh, Rico Simonini adapted that stage play into this movie. 
uh, which is which I, I just think is fascinating, especially because you know it's it's Will Manis who who wrote it, and who wrote the original play. So um, I, I want to take a look at it, and he sent it to us. And you know what? Honestly, for it, it, these kinds of movies show up every once in a while. They're kind of accused of being vanity projects and whatnot. You know, somebody gets a little bit of money and they make a movie, and it want, usually winds up being terrible. This is a very competent film with some really, really good names, and it tells a really interesting story. And it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson as to uh, if you have a good story and you want to make a movie, there really shouldn't be anything standing in your way. Uh, not anymore, not with the tools that we have, not with the, especially if you're, you're in any kind of part of the world where there are resources and just about everybody has resources now, wherever you live, cameras and editing equipment and, and the resources to put a movie together. And so bravo for, for, uh, for Rico Simonini for making this happen. It is, uh, it's a really, really interesting story and he does a really good job. So don't make too much fun of Rico here. Rico has been in a lot of movies. Yeah, uh, as an actor, yeah, uh, yeah, he's going like twenty years in movies. I uh, play the doctor in Bruce Almighty. Yeah, uh, that's probably how he got started on it. Uh, yeah, but he, but he also shows up in a, in a in a couple of episodes of Supergirl. You know, I'm a Supergirl. Guy. I did not know that. Oh yeah, uh, Rico's Rico's been around for a minute and and, and just done a lot of stuff. So yeah, uh, cardiologist, yes, but you know, cardiologist slash actor. <laughs> you can do that nowadays, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. Well. It's uh, it's Frank and Ava, and you should check it out. Eric Roberts, uh, Eric Roberts is also very, very good in it. Um, did, did you want to talk about v, uh, uh, VFW? Yeah, let's talk about VFW. This thing's crazy, man. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's kind of it's kind of wicked though, because you know I'm an old veteran, so the yeah. veterans of foreign wars. There's one right down the street from me. I wander in there every now and again. Uh, it, it, what's funny is that I'm getting to be the same age as the guys <laughs> in there, and I'm like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? This should be, this should be a place where a bunch of old vets hung out, and they, they look at me and they say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, old vet. Anyway, uh, uh, so you have these group of old veterans, and they have this little local VF. W post, and uh, you have these these drug guys, uh, 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 drug dealers, uh, gang guys who want to move in and take their spot, and they're not going to let them take their spot. So you got Stephen Lang, and you got Fred Williamson, and you got uh, William Sattler. I mean, just uh, all these guys whose faces. Martin Cove. Yeah. Martin Cove was the was the bad guy in um. Karate uh, Kid. Karate, Karate Kid. Kid. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell all these guys in, in, in this movie, you know. Uh, and uh, they got some this is a young person they have to take care of. So it's just one of these movies about a bunch of old vets who are not going to let these drug pushing gang bangers <laughs> take over. This it's spot. it's it's really it's really really fun and it's really funny. And the thing is, all you really need to say is. Stephen Lang, William Sadler, Martin Cove, and Fred Williamson turn it up to 11. All of them have a screen persona. They are all very aware of it. They know exactly what audiences expect of them. And they come out and they just, they crank up everything they have ever done in any other movie. And they just do that to the nth degree. And it's really fun. I have to say, I really, I mean, Williamson's done this before and, and Stephen Lang does it routinely. Yeah. But but I gotta say, seeing William Sadler just completely go to the mat with this character was so much fun. Was so much fun. I haven't seen him do anything this 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 far out in in a long time. So uh, that was that was that was the, the the treat for me. This is actually a really fun movie. This is from uh, from R L J E Films, uh, Robert Johnson's operation, and uh, uh, directed by Joe Begos. Don't even know who Joe Begos is, but good on you, Joe. You did a good job with this. It's on Blu-ray. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, something called Goldie. Ah, oh, Goldie. Yeah, Goldie uh, from Film Movement. This was look. A, it's this, this is one of those. This is one of those. It's one of those movies where a bunch of girls <laughs> decide they're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, and a bunch of boys end up paying for it. A bunch of bunch of bad men actually end up paying for it. And I always love those. What the hell can I say? Uh, it, you know, I I like Slick Woods. She plays Goldie. She's the mm. she's the lead in it. Never seen her before. I think she's a real talent. I think she's there's something really really raw and uh, and compelling about her. She's she's sexy, but not in an exploitative way. And. Uh, uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, and, she, and she can act. She, I mean, she, you know, yeah, yeah, sure, the stuff with the gun and the, and the you know, yeah. the hot and stuff, that, that's all fine. But, you know, the drama stuff, all of that stuff, she can act. And and that's what actually counts. Really, yep. really good. For sure. For sure. Also got a got a crazy, weird kind of transformery knockoff mecha thing here called Brave Storm, which is, uh, you know, not uh, not terribly good. But it's if, if you're a fan of the genre, if you can kind of put up with uh, sort of these these knockoff Japanese um, wannabe transformer things, 
It's okay. It's it's in it's in the ballpark. It's not anime. It's uh, it's just it's just one of these straight up kind of uh, live action genre adaptations. It takes place in 2050, and uh, the very last human beings on Earth uh, are doing a bit of a, a Terminator deal. They're going back in time to uh, try to stop when the machines got out of out of control. And uh, you know, so it's it's a little bit of Terminator, a little bit of Transformers, a little bit of all that anime stuff. Um, yeah, you know, and it's 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 fine. It's worth checking out. If you you know if this is your thing, I'd, I'd say it's a little bit of um, what was the uh, the Del Toro deal uh, Pacific Rim, ah, a yes. little bit of ah, yes. little bit of Pacific Rim in there as well. So it's it's kind of all that mixed together. Uh, and this is this is uh, you you can watch it in English. It's got an English dub version, but I would recommend the uh, the Japanese track just because it feels more authentic. Uh, let's see what do we do next here. Uh, let me let me roll through just. Um, uh, some music real quickly. We've got some more stuff from Naxos, and then we'll we'll dive into some TV. Um, got first of all, the only thing to hear that's not classical is really not classical, and uh, this is uh, this is uh, Christian Death Death Club, nineteen eighty one to nineteen ninety three special edition CD and DVD combo set. Um, not not familiar with these guys, kind of you know death metal. Uh, not really my kind of music. Uh, you know when you have a track on here that is called Psalm, and then in parentheses Maggot's Lair, that kind of gives you <laughs> that gives you an idea of what you're dealing with. Uh, the, you know it's 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 all kind of you know oh, it, it's dang it, kids. I know 1981 and 1993. That's when this stuff you could get away with this stuff. But anyway. I, I didn't even bother, didn't even bother with the the DVD after listeners. I I heard like two or three of the tracks. I'm like, yep, I can let that one go. Uh, you don't need my recommendation from that. But the DVD basically is their performance from uh, January of 1990 at the Mason Jar. Oh, I, I remember that. Do you? No. Where Where's the Mason Jar? No, I don't remember that at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I never heard of the Mason Jar. Well, wherever the Mason Jar is. They performed there in 1990, and I am not going to watch the DVD to see it, but if uh, that's your thing, knock yourselves out. Uh, <coughs> there's my COVID coming back. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let me just blow through these real quickly here. I got a couple from the C major line. Uh, Rossini's La Cerenentola. Cheren Cerenentola, however you pronounce it. Uh, it's a, an opera I was not familiar with. It's done in a little, in kind of a cheeky black comedy, uh, very dark and avant-garde way. I, uh, with the orchestra and choir of the Teatro Opera de Rome, not really my speed. Uh, it's, it's a little bit weird and surreal. Uh, the costumes are weird and it kind of, uh, I'm sure somebody would really, really respond to it. it. Just wasn't my thing. Also a musical journey across Austria, live from the golden hall of the music brand Vienna is the Vienna Johann Strauss orchestra conducted by Johannes Wildner, uh, which is basically just a lot of beautiful, beautiful Austrian waltz music. Uh, primarily Strauss from the Strauss family, Johann Strauss Sr., Johann Strauss Jr., Edward Strauss. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a, it's a lot of polkas and, uh, and waltzes. And if you like that kind of thing, you'll just have a grand old time. It's really, really sweet. I love waltzes. My mother loved waltzes. So it's my speed. It's not something I'll sit and watch, but you put it on in the background, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Five and the Shostakovich Violin Concerto Number no. One, performed by Andres Nelsons and by Bascride and the Gewandhaus Orchestra. Uh, Andres Nelsons is conducting. Uh, by Bascride is the violin soloist. And uh, this is in, recorded in Leipzig in May of last year. Really, just uh, only if you love these two pieces of music: the uh, Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Five and Shostakovich Concerto Number no. One. Um, but there have been better performances of both. Then there is also Mozart's uh, Die Entführung aus dem Serail, uh, which is okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't quite follow much of what was going on here, uh, but, you know, it's all right. That's uh, that's also from C major. Um, then here's the really, really good stuff. The uh, the um, Oh, hold on. Got a couple from Opus Arte here I'm going to mention first. So we've got um, the Northern Ballet performing Victoria um, with music by Philip Feeney and uh, choreography by Kathy Marston. That is absolutely wonderful. That is really, really terrific. Very kind of um, 
it's the story of Queen Victoria's uh, diaries, and it's it's done in, in ballet style, and it's really, really beautifully, wonderfully, wonderfully put together. Kathy Marston is an amazing choreographer, like one of the great British choreographers of all time. And then uh, Wagner's Die Valkyrie, the Valkyrie, uh, performed by the Royal Opera House, also very, very impressively done, great art direction, really wonderful singing, and, uh, and very, very dramatic, very, very Wagnerian. Um, Naxos themselves has Carl Maria, uh, Carl Maria von Weber's opera Euronthe, which is uh, done in a very modern style. And uh, that's, uh, you know, he's a 19th century uh, uh, composer, but this is done very kind of 20th century and um, kind of an interesting interpretation. Um, then there's also Respighi's La Bella Dormente nel Bosco, which is a little bit uh, avant-garde in that weird Italian way as well. This is, uh, uh, that is, of course, Sleeping Beauty is the uh, the uh, it's a musical fairy tale in three acts is basically how it's uh, it's described. Um, not really my style of Sleeping Beauty. I like the Disney movie, but um, you know, it'll it'll, it'll pass. Yeah. Uh, and then the last two here is um, a portrait of dance superstar Natalia Osipova called Force of Nature which is uh, uh, quite lovely and compelling. Not familiar with her prior to this. Very, very interested after that. She was originally a, uh, a principal in the Royal Ballet. Uh, and uh, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful portrait of a rather extraordinary uh, dancer who came from Russia and migrated from the American Ballet Theater eventually to the Royal Opera House in, in uh, the UK. And, uh, and what, what, it, what it takes to be a dancer of that caliber and that level. It's a lot of dedication, and, and she's quite a fascinating figure. And then lastly, uh, Written on Skin, Lessons in Love and Violence with the uh, Orchestra of the Royal Opera House, conducted by George Benjamin and directed by Katie Mitchell. Um, this is um, uh, George Benjamin music and Martin Crimp text for kind of a... Um, uh, a couple of modernist um, operas, Written on Skin being one, Lessons in Love and Violence uh, is the other. And uh, not exactly my speed, uh, a little bit, little bit, you know, kind of like Nixon in China. I don't really understand when they overly modernize these things. But, um, you know, they're, uh, some people love that stuff. George Benjamin is certainly a figure with a following, so uh, I will not be overly critical. Uh, Tim, let's let's get into some TV. Oh, absolutely, particularly some of the classic stuff here. The the final battle. We're talking about the 1984 yeah. final season, final episode uh, of the 1984 series, which was created by a guy, an interesting guy named Ken Johnson. Ken, Ken's not a one hit wonder. Uh, if you if you if nope. you're thinking about that, uh, if you have an interview, he goes way back. Uh, started out writing on One Adam Twelve's uh, Six Million Dollar Man. Yeah, by the woman. Uh, you know all kinds of all kinds of great stuff from him, and then of course V, uh, the sort of classic series, which have, uh, I think that they rebooted that what maybe about ten years ago or so. Um, they, yeah, it was uh, about that V series. To, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but but it popped it popped up uh, for a while again. Anyway, I remember watching this way back in 1984 when I was in the United States Air Force. I think I was stationed someplace down in Arkansas, and this was one of my favorite series at the time. Um, every episode was exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> And that there, it always had a moment of where someone's uh, uh, skin uh, would be torn slightly. <laughs> You'd see the scales. And you would see the scales of the alien reptile yeah. underneath. That happened in absolutely every episode yeah. of V. Uh, and it happens in V, the final battle as well. Um, uh, step by step, uh, the, 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 the 1991 series, which, of course... For those of us born a little bit earlier, we knew it was just a sort of reconfiguration of the old Brady Bunch series. From the <laughs> it's one of those blended family series. Here you had Patrick Duffy, who, uh, of course, famously had been had played Bobby Ewing on uh, on Dallas for years. But we, people of a certain generation, remember him originally as Aquaman. Yeah, no, uh, uh, Man from Atlantis. Man from Atlantis. Yeah, Thank you very much. Wait, yeah. correct me on that. Man from Atlantis, uh, ill-fated series. It only lasted a few seconds, but made famous the sort of dolphin kick uh, uh, style of swimming. Yeah, uh, Patrick Duffy here, Suzanne Summers here. Suzanne, of course, had been on Three's Company, and and this this series ran from 1991 to 1998. It was, it was a long-running series, but it was one of the early series in the syndicated uh, style of television making. It wasn't a network series. It was a, it was a syndicated series. Um, so depending on where you were in, were in the country, you watched this in, in, in various different places. But yeah, it was, it was sort of like a Brady Bunchy kind of thing. It was a lot of fun. It ran for a long, long time. Step by step, 
seventh and final season. That's what we have there. Uh, Madam Secretary, Matt, uh, thinking about Madam Secretary bugs me a little bit. Wade, you'll, you'll remember why. Yeah, well, it, it, this uh, was. But you know, Madam yeah. Secretary. Well, you know, what do you mean? Uh, well, the final season is out uh, in a separate uh, volume, but they also have all six seasons. I can't believe this ran for six seasons. 120 episodes over six seasons in a boxed set, a big, fatty boxed set, which comes with an additional four hours of special features. I don't know that this show really deserves all that. Yeah. Um, I, I watched um, maybe, I don't know, five or six episodes of this show out of the, the, the 120 episodes, and... I it just never grabbed me, man. It never it never felt like anything but uh, an attempt to just kind of um, uh, sort of. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say it was, it was it was like a Hillary Clinton campaign ad, but there was something about it that felt like they were sort of trying to rather than tell a story and give Tia Leone something to do, they were just trying to make a point in every episode. And it kind of got, and the and the drama gets lost in the point, and uh, it 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 just it it never really took flight for me. I didn't I didn't believe anybody on the show. It wasn't well. It, it fancied itself a West Wingy sort of show. It yeah, wasn't, so it wasn't West Wingy, which is way was always way too didactic for me anyway. But um, uh, it, it, it fancied itself there, but it wasn't that kind of Aaron Sorkin writing. Right. Um, That's uh, it. That, so, you know, he so couldn't approach that while at the same time, you know, it wasn't funny enough. And which is terrible because Tia Leone was really, really, a, is a very, very funny actress. Really funny. But, but this didn't live in the zone of, uh, you know, what's the, what's, what's the show uh, with the vice president, with uh, Julia louis Drake. Oh, yeah, Veep. This did, Veep, Veep. It didn't live over there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you have this serious show with this funny actress. And, uh, yeah. Whatever. Police yeah. Squad, on the other hand. Oh. Uh, series. The best. That's, that's just damn funny. And it's you know this was only six episodes. This just yeah. tells you how how stupid TV viewers are. This is one of the funniest TV series in the history, and people just were they didn't connect to the comedy enough. The it, without you know a laugh track to prompt them when to laugh. It only lasted six episodes, and they pulled the plug. I think today you would probably get this on Netflix or Amazon Prime, and you'd you'd go for five or six seasons. They'd just stick with it. And uh, it's just, it's too bad. But man, these are six really classic episodes. And uh, it's on Blu-ray. So much fun. Uh, I think these are funnier than, funnier than the Naked Gun movies. I think this is where this premise needs to live. It needed to be a TV series. But eventually it became the Naked Gun movies. Um, a lot of stuff on here. There's a, uh, there's some audio, you know, the audio, audio commentary for um, The Butler Did It. Um, there's commentary for Testimony of Evil. Um, the, the and some you know different people get, like Robert Wool does a commentary for Testimony of Evil. The uh, Zucker Brothers and Jim Abrahams and Robert Weiss do it on The Butler Did It. Um, the uh, they also do a commentary on the, a substantial gift. I mean, so there's there's some fun stuff on here where they talk about the show and they give you some really great anecdotes. I wish there was more. Um, there's a few other special features, an interview with Leslie Nielsen, gag reel, a few other featurettes, and uh, you know some other things that just kind of make you laugh if you if you missed them on the show then the feature it's kind of cue you into what you should be looking for and laughing at i can watch this over and over and over and i probably will i'm probably going to throw this on this evening and just just watch the whole series straight through because it's just so damn funny well so many of the gags in that series are sight gags yeah that you really can toss it on and and, and if you're walking by there's, there's, there's very like it's very likely that something very funny is just going to be happening on the screen uh, because you know the, the, that sort of visual humor, yeah, you know, a lot of verbal humor too, but I, a lot of side gags are just hysterical. I'm going to tell you, I have seen this entire series probably four times straight through. Yeah. Uh, the, the original time it aired, I watched. You know, they reran it uh, the following summer, and I watched most of those. I saw, I've seen it, watched it at least a couple of times on DVD. I, and, and I'll tell you, every single time there is stuff you see that you missed. The every frame is so loaded with stuff, and the beauty of having it on DVD or Blu-ray is you go, wait a minute, I got to back that up, and you back it up, <laughs> and then when you back it up to see the thing that you missed, you catch something else that you missed. Like there is so much going on in every frame. There is so much. It's so clever. It's so smart, and and I I just I don't know. They they must have just worked their butts off to to fill every single episode with all this other stuff. It's really fun. Uh, we also have Criminal Minds, the final season. Oh, good, 15, 15 good seasons. grief. How did this show run that long, Tim? 
I don't, you know, it really blows me away. Um, uh, well, you, the, some of these shows make it so incredibly long. This, you know, a fairly, a fairly ordinary sort of uh, FBI behavioral analysis unit kind of thing, you know, chasing down and finding the, the darkest. This, this season here, they chased this one guy. Uh, uh, played very well by Michael Mosley yeah. called The Chameleon, a master of the skies. Now, this is almost a storyline out of a Sherlock Holmes yeah. sort, of, sort, of, sort of dynamic. Yet this is a sort of modern show. Uh, and, uh, you know, hey, uh, uh, Joe Mantegna uh, yeah, he, he plays this guy, uh, Matthew Gray, uh, Penelope Garcia. It's all fine, I suppose. But, man, I got to tell you, this would have been two or three seasons worth of television back in the day. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Uh, let me hit some Kino stuff here uh, we've had for a little while. There's some stuff from Kino Classics that really, really warrants uh, some mentioning. There's um, this one called Je t'aime moi non plus, which means I love you, me neither. I know that doesn't make any sense, but it, it, there, it means something if you are a Serge Gensborg fan. Uh, mm -hmm. Serge Gensborg, the father of Charlotte Gensborg, and his then wife, uh, British actress and famous French singer Jane Birkin, she's primarily more of a success in France than she was in her native England, uh, they are, of course, Charlotte Gainsbourg's parents and uh, did a lot of work together, and this is one of them. Gainsbourg himself, the legendary and very controversial uh, French songwriter, uh, wrote and directed this movie, Je t'aime moi non plus, starring his wife, Jane Birkin, and the infamous Joe D'Alessandro of so many uh, Andy Warhol movies. And um, it's it's basically a kind of a, a working class doomed um, relationship movie. It's uh, you know it's about a waitress and a, a, a gay truck driver who have um, uh, who have uh, well it, it it winds up being a love triangle, and I don't want to give anything away. But there's a uh, there's there's a thing that that that, that goes on there. So. It, it winds up going into a really interesting, weird, dark, and and kind of depressing place. And, but it's an interesting kind of French film from 1976 that also just happens to have some really unusual supporting performances, including Gerard Depardieu, uh, who it, it just show, who shows up in here. And, and if you don't know that he's, you, you kind of need to know he's coming because otherwise it'll take you out of the movie completely. So that is uh, that's a very interesting. I won't say it's a great film, but it's a significant film and a historical film of a very certain interesting nature. Um, then also from Kino Classics, we have the uh, little known The Man Who Was Sherlock Holmes, which is a uh, a German film, believe it or not, mm. made in. Um, uh, 1937, I think it was, and uh, it, it's a, it's, it's sort of a fascinating, it's, it's kind of a fascinating, weird historical artifact because it, it, it's, it's made under Hitler, and yet it's a, it's a Sherlock Holmes movie, and, and you have to remember that at the same time, Sherlock Holmes, who is a 19th century figure, was showing up in a whole lot of these Basil Rathbone movies where suddenly mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes is a guy who's fighting Nazis. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, that's, that's kind of a weird thing. You're like, wait a minute. I thought Sherlock Holmes was fighting Dr. Moriarty and now he's fighting Hitler. How did that happen? It, it, you know what, when in, 19, in, in the 1930s and forties, everybody was fighting Hitler. So that's how that happened. Um, but, but, uh, I think Frankenstein and Dracula fought, uh, <laughs> probably in a, in a, in a universal film. Yeah, right? Probably. So, <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, it's a, this is a really interesting, weird thing. It's, it's not really a Sherlock Holmes movie that we would understand, but if you look at it as kind of a, um, a, a, you know, the kind of film that gets made under an oppressive government when you, you, when they just sort of start you know, taking away uh, uh, press freedoms and artistic freedoms and artists are left to sort of use uh, traditional material in unorthodox ways. It, it's a it's a great kind of a teaching tool. Um, so, again, not a good film, but an, certainly an interesting film. Uh, the story of the Baron Munchausen has been told many, many times, even before Terry Gilliam. One of the most interesting ones is from uh, 1943, which is also a, a German film that was made in Nazi Germany uh, right before the end of the war. And um, it was supposed to celebrate the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the Ufa Studios that were so famous from even before the, the advent of, of Nazism. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's actually quite good. It's not really a propaganda film. 
it's just uh, taking something that was very much an iconic piece of Fran of German literature and really trying to trying to give it a big push. It's really trying to give German audiences something to take their minds off the war is maybe a better way to put it. Uh, in any case, really, really very compelling. From 1943, in many respects, the equal of the Terry Gilliam film, I would say, and really, really worth checking out. That's on Blu-ray. Uh, that is Munchausen by Joseph von Bakke. Uh, starring uh, Hans Albers. I remember my mother used to talk about that a lot. She was a big oh, fan yeah. of Hans Albers. And then Rudolph Valentino in Blood and Sand, one of the, the great uh, last Paramount Silence, and one of the last films that Valentino was in. He didn't really make the transition to, to talkies. And this is from 1922. This is a tinted transfer, uh, and it is an absolutely gorgeous, wonderful movie. You, you recognize that Rudolph Valentino really is one of the all-time great movie matinee idols. I mean, he rivals anybody from today. And a lot of fantastic special features here, including an audio commentary by um, Anthony Slide, film historian. Uh, also a filmed introduction from Orson Welles, which contextualizes it very nicely. The trailer, footage of Valentino's funeral procession. Uh, and there's oh, wow. even, yeah, and then there's even a, a parody film with Will Rogers that I thought was really uh, quite fun. Um, Tim, we're gonna we're gonna go out. I got a couple more keynotes here, but I want to make we're, we're gonna we're gonna you and I'll talk about those in just a second. I want to make quick mention of the one criterion this week, oh. Our, uh, Army of Shadows by Jean Pierre Melville. Really uh, a great 1969 uh, classic. I mean, just an absolute classic from from Melville. Um, this is Melville kind of at the end of his career and uh, based on a Joseph Kessel novel, which is about the French resistance. And it's, uh, you know, uh, people don't know that Melville himself was part of the French resistance during the war. So he's, mm. it's kind of semi-autobiographical in a lot of ways. It's not, it's not his usual gangster film. It's really something that's very, very close to his heart. You feel him uh, much more in it. It's really a wonderful, wonderful uh, film in so many ways, beautifully photographed. Uh, from 1969, just superb. Tons of extras on here, including archival interviews with Melville and all of his collaborators. Um, a, a short documentary that was um, uh, shot on the front lines during the final days of German occupation. And um, uh, a lot of other really wonderful stuff. Audio commentary from 2006 with a film scholar it was originally on, the, uh, on the, the previous DVD release. So that's Army of Shadows. Tim, let's talk for a second about famous women filmmakers like oh. Al Alice Guy Blachet. The wonderful Alice Guy Blaché, extraordinary, uh, mostly French, but not exactly, um, a female filmmaker who who came into the film industry at the dawn of the of the film industry. She was right there, uh, literally, uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the 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 French brothers, the Lumiere brothers, uh, actually worked for Gaumont. Uh, and became uh, one of the wonderful, uh, one of the first uh, f uh, female filmmakers, first filmmakers of any sort, first directors, let's put it that way, of, of any sort in the industry. Uh, and went on to do many, many extraordinary things. Uh, one of the first people to work with color, one of the first people to work with sound, one of the first people to understand how to write this scenario. Mm -hmm. Areas. Uh, one of one of the first people to understand editing and how powerful that could be. Uh, a, a little woman who was lost to history and and, and and refound and lost again two or three times over the last almost 100 years now. Yeah. Uh, and here we have this extraordinary series. Um, Pamela Green made a wonderful uh, doc. Uh, what was it called again? Be natural. Be natural. Story of Alice Blesche. Yeah, so, uh, so this uh, extraordinary set here. So what do we have here with this volume one, volume it, two? It's terrific. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we did interview Pamela on the show, so people uh, should might want to go back and, and check that out. Uh, that was a few months ago we, we talked to Pamela in, in detail about her documentary, and she talked about all the wonderful things that Alice Guy Blaché did. And this is a perfect complement to her documentary. This is uh, volume one is the Gaumont years, and volume two is the Solox years. And uh, this is part of which a, was in New Jersey, by the way. Yes, first, first woman to have her own film studio when, when all of film was on the East Coast. Yep, uh, and, and extraordinary. It's amazing. It's really amazing, and in such a long career too. I mean, the so the Gaumont years cover from nineteen from eighteen ninety seven to nineteen oh seven. Ten years in France at the very, very, very beginning of cinema. I mean, the earliest years, late nineteenth century, right into those early years when people just didn't really understand what was going on. 
And there's so much here. Uh, you know, at the, at the Hypnotist from 1898. Wonderful absinthe. How's that? Wonderful absinthe from 1899, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, that tells you that there's no censorship going on there. Uh, 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 these are all just, these are all really almost experimental films in some way. Uh, the, the Results of Feminism from 1906. Um, uh, midwife to the upper class, 1902. You can tell they're all. I mean, she's not pulling her punches. She's dealing with all kinds of things that, in a cinematic way, that are that are relevant to her, relevant to society. Uh, it's a really uh, exciting time. And then the Solox years covers from 1911 to 1914, uh, all black and white and tinted, and uh, really extraordinary. It's about two and a half hours of stuff on volume one. And uh, about three and a half hours, uh, four hours. Actually, it's over four hours of stuff on volume two. So, I mean, it's, you know, you can spend all day watching this and just being enthralled by it. It's absolutely glorious. And this is part of an overall series, um, Pioneers, First Women Filmmakers, that, uh, that Kino is releasing. And uh, there's another volume here as well which is Lenore Ulrich in The Intrigue, uh, which is part of the forgotten films of writer and director oh, Ju Julia yeah. Crawford Ivers, another real pioneer at the time. Uh, these are all from uh, 1915 and 16, four different uh, films. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, that, you know, starting with Alice Guy Blaché, we're now getting into these, these forgotten women filmmakers. And you and I talk about this a lot because in those early days, when everything was kind of the Wild West, there were a lot of women involved in making movies. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of them doing the things now that we would call directing. That, that, that word didn't really exist at the time. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the screenwriter, none of the you know, scenarist and all this kind of stuff. A yeah. lot of folks were coming over from the theater, of course. <laughs> and, and, it, and it took a moment before uh, the industry sorted out where the power lay. Uh, so for a while there, a lot of what we would call directors were women. Yeah, uh, and men and men would, would would do the things that men do. They would grab that camera uh, and, uh, and and big things that they could move and and and, and build and stuff like that. So you know, a lot of the men were cinematographers and uh, and 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 that kind of thing. And eventually, men started to figure out, wait a minute, yeah, <laughs> that that chick over there seems to be telling everybody what to do. True. Uh, and uh, and then and then the industry became what the industry became. Although women uh, did still continue to be the, the most important editors. Uh, and it was, I, I would say, probably to this very day. But oh, absolutely. Through the first, the, the, the editors uh, were women. 60, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, were also a golden period for, for women as editors. Lots of women, uh, and I know some too, do uh, some great work on television today as well. Really, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of where they, where they thrive more so than men in many respects. Um, in, in any case, this last one, Lenore Ulrich, uh, in The Intrigue, the, as part of the forgotten films of uh, Julia Crawford Ivers, um, really, really worth checking out. Now, Julia Crawford Ivers, I should point out as well, is is a, a kind of a tragic figure because she was a screenwriter and then she became a director. And um, in the case here, the 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 there are two films here. There are four films total. Uh, the intrigue is something she wrote. is directed by Frank Lloyd. That was from uh, 1916. Um, and then there, there's uh, William Desmond Taylor's Ben Blair, which she also wrote, which was based on a novel, and that was also from 1916. And then there are two that she directed. The Majesty of the Law is almost all lost. There's only the, the last reel, the fourth reel, is the only thing that they have from this. So you're watching this to sort of fill in the rest that's in, your, in the back of your mind. You know, what if we had the rest of the reels? They're lost. We don't have them. It's 13 minutes of a movie that should be about an hour or uh, an hour plus. Yeah. Um, and then the other one shows you the, the full extent of her genius. She wrote and directed it entirely herself. The, uh, a Son of Aaron, starring Dustin uh, Farnham. And, that's, uh, now, that's in the Library of Congress. What and that, it, yes, yes. And, and that's an absolutely uh, – it's a wonderful film. It's just wonderful. So uh, great restorations here, great digital restorations, really important. And uh, this is going to be a wonderful ongoing series, so absolutely perfect. Uh, Pioneers, First Women Filmmakers. Uh, so good on you with that one, Kino. Uh, all right, Tim, that should do it for this week. And, uh, you know, hopefully mm. hopefully we'll be back next week. There, There is some stuff. We've got a lot of foreign and some documentaries and uh, – some other things that I think we can uh, we can uh, uh, really uh, clean up next week. So, uh, unless uh, unless something uh, adverse happens, we will certainly have a show next week. That's what we'll plan on. But stick with it, and uh, we will see you guys later. Yes. yes.